And ideally, the uh, prerequisite of this lecture is exactly uh, the lecture given yesterday by Paolo Moras that was about the ex experimental setup and uh, open problems and latest developments about the ARPES, uh, Angle Resolved Photoemission Spectroscopy. And uh, indeed, so I'll uh, try to catch up on, uh, on, on this subject starting from a theory perspective. So let's trying to analyze the ARPES uh, uh, spectroscopy from uh, uh, many body perspective uh, and uh, uh, we'll connect this, uh, uh, this is a spoiler eventually to the uh, interacting spectral function that is a quantity you can get out of the Green's function uh, that is this part here so we'll introduce the uh, Green's function, one, uh, one particle Green's function again uh, uh, having a look at the properties and especially keeping an eye on the, on the spectral uh, function. And eventually we would like to compute uh, the interacting Green's function, how to do that via the computation of a self-energy and the uh, simplest, uh, uh, if you want, still meaningful and not uh, toy model-like approximation to a self-energy is probably, and the most popular, is probably the GW method. So this is pretty much the uh, menu of uh, this talk. So let, let's start from uh, ARPES. Again, here is uh, pretty much a sketch of the experiment. You have direct photoemission where you shine light on your uh, sample and you look at electrons getting out. Then you have inverse photoemission when electrons impinge on uh, the subset and uh, you take a uh, photon out. So, uh, and then uh, in principle you have a number of other uh, spectroscopies where you have uh, uh, here uh, absor light absorption is uh, one of them or uh, yields uh, electron energy loss spectroscopies. So uh, these are, mm, let's say, macro classes of the spectroscopies and the important point from a theoretical perspective is that some of these are charged spectroscopies, meaning that electrons are either added or withdrawn from the system. So uh, direct photoemission, we end up with uh, a system having n minus one electrons. In inverse photoemission, we add one electron to the system. And uh, this <coughs> other broader class here contains all sp the spectroscopy that simply keep the number of the electrons in the system the same. So here, we just have excita neutral excitation. So charge versus neutral excitations. From a theory point of view, this is a first uh, very important discriminant when you want to look at the spectroscopy, especially because uh, different uh, uh, so charge spectroscopies require some tools, neutral spectroscopies require uh, other tools. Let's have a look at the uh, ARPES. This is the same picture shown uh, yesterday. So e experimentally, what can we tune here? Uh, we have incident uh, photons uh, that uh, can be discriminated in terms of their uh, energy, the angle at which they uh, hit uh, the surface, their polarization, and the experiment just measures the kinetic energy uh, of the upcoming electron, ideally also completing or complementing the information, including the angle of the outcoming electrons, and as we I've seen yesterday also the spin of the of the electron. We can have spin resolved uh, ARPES and angle and angle resolved photoemission. And in principle, this is the the experimental tool that allows us to access experimentally the band structure. So the band structure that is a concept that is very familiar to each of us. Uh, in, instead, there's a precise experimental counterpart that is exactly, if you want, what you can get out of the uh, ARPES uh, uh, experiment. Here is uh, a model, a cartoon. Uh, we see here a, a simple density of states. We have core levels, we have a valence levels with a dispersion, and this is a metal. We have a Fermi level that crosses the valence. There's a, uh, the vacuum level, so we also have access to the continuum. And here is a cartoon outcome of the photoemission experiment. Uh, for each of these, we add uh, the photon energy, so we get peaks uh, uh, discrete, though broadened, 
out of the um, core levels, and then we have uh, somehow a mirror picture of the valence that is though cut at the Fermi level since we are extracting electrons and we cannot extract electrons at energies larger or higher than the Fermi level. Actually, if we take uh, more complicated versions of this experiment, we can, and the main idea is that uh, perhaps we have a two-step, uh, like two-photon uh, photo emission, so with the first photon we excite electrons here, and then we do photo emissions out of the excited left. But all of that is, let's say, uh, state of the art, or is, uh, I'm not going to treat those uh, uh, complications. But that is the main point. Also importantly, this is just a, a side remark about the experiment. While we think uh, that we are actually able to compute electronic scratch for any system we have in mind, experimentally, the fact that we are getting an electron out of the system means uh, that uh, we have to take care of charge neutrality. So I if we had uh, an insulating, uh, hard insulator uh, substrate, uh, after a while we can no longer extract electrons because uh, the system gets charged. So in these experiments, most of the time you have uh, a metallic substrate, uh, perhaps you have a thin insulating layer, but still, I mean, you have all these uh, issues uh, experimentally that of course are not there in the theory, just for us to, uh, to keep in mind. And here instead is, a, so if this is a cartoon, this is a uh, realistic, uh, uh, realistic data out of, uh, I think these are obtained here in uh, Trieste, the synchrotron. This is a very nice uh, uh, RPES uh, picture for uh, system here is graphene absorbed on nickel, and uh, uh, here you see some uh, bands connected to graphene, but graphene on nickel is interacting, the Dirac cone is broken, so the Dirac cone should be here. This, uh, uh, the, the sharp cut here is the Fermi level, so the Dirac cone should be here, it's shifted here just because of the interaction uh, between graphene and the substance. So besides the actual physics and chemistry that happen here, this is pretty much what we can obtain out of this uh, uh, measurements. Okay, ah, here is a, uh, a deeper look at this point here and so on. So theoretical treatment, there are, uh, I mean, this is very well established. Uh, here I've listed a couple of uh, uh, reference papers uh, to me and we can start using the Fermi golden rule if we want to describe this process. So we want to describe an excitation uh, driven by uh, the absorption of this photon where uh, we have an initial state that is pretty much the ground state of the uh, system and a final state uh, that is composed of uh, an electron that is, if you want, traveling extracted from the system, ideally in a state like a plane wave-like state uh, in vacuum, times, uh, but in a sense of a mathematical uh, product uh, of uh, within the, the Il Hilbert space uh, times what is left uh, that is, mm, is not meant to be the ground state with n minus one. Actually is uh, 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 a relative uh, of an excited state at n minus one. So this is the standard uh, uh, Fermi golden rule. We have the perturbation is the uh, photon. And what is important here in terms of modeling is exactly how you model the, uh, the final state. Ah, here, if you want, you can also check the uh, energy conservation is, I mean, uh, rearranged in this way, but we have the three terms, the free electron out, the N minus one system excited, and the neutral system ground state. Here the notation that I'm going to use throughout uh, the talk is that uh, n is the number of particles, zero is the ground state, and s in this form here just labels any excitation uh, of the system at, uh, in this case, n minus one electrons. So the final state can be written in, uh, in this form here. So basically we start with a system with n minus one electron excited. We create uh, a free electron uh, 
uh, we add a free electron uh, in vacuum. And then we have this term here that comes from scattering theory that takes into account the fact that uh, the process is way more complicated. So somehow uh, we need to take this system here and then we uh, continue it inside the, so in vacuum and then we continue it inside the system since uh, finding basically the proper final state or computing photoemission by computing the proper final state is already a task uh, per se, something that is done in the literature. Uh, we'll see typically undergoes the name of uh, uh, one step uh, model for photoemission. But this is something that you have to calculate. And uh, here is the uh, physical interpretation of what happens in the, in the process. First, uh, uh, this can be broken down into three pieces, uh, that, and this is eventually what uh, is called three-step model. Uh, that is, uh, let's say, the, probably the simplest uh, approach to the, to the problem. You first think of an excitation from uh, where, uh, like your valence band or where uh, your electrons sit to some available uh, excited states in the system. Then you have to uh, just have this electron moving throughout the system. So you have, uh, and by doing this, basically, uh, it can have an, uh, other mechanisms of energy loss. So somehow, ex pretty much as the energy loss spectroscopy, so an electron moving throughout a system that loses energies, uh, ex further exciting the system itself. And then you go through um, the surface, uh, and the electron is ejected into uh, vacuum. Especially, so all of this is arbitrary, pretty much. So the, the, the actual separation of the three steps is kind of arbitrary, is pictorial. And also I, I liked a lot the comment Stefano Baroni made yesterday. So it's not just giving names to things that we can actually, uh, can think we, we understand them. So uh, this is just a, a pictorial view and some of these are just names, okay? And especially the split, uh, uh, between these two processes here is not really unique. Let's just keep this uh, in mind. And then uh, we can make approximations on this, in particular the sudden approximation that somehow says that uh, if the ejected electron is fast enough, it goes fast enough into vacuum, we could kind of simplify the uh, procedure so we can drop this term here, the scattering, the actual creation and description of the final state uh, from the theory and just describe our final state uh, as this. So excited state uh, n minus one particle plus an extra electron that is uh, in uh, vacuum. So this is the uh, approximated final state. And if you do the math now, so if you compute the photoemission current, that is this, you obtain uh, uh, this expression here, this delta term here contains basically the matrix element with the perturbation that then will end up being squared. But here, importantly, we find an object uh, that uh, is theoretically very clean, that is the spectral function uh, that is defined in this way here. So this is sum over all occupied states. In this case, uh, uh, there are these uh, uh, brackets uh, here uh, that uh, I'll show you in a second, basically play the role of uh, uh, single particle orbitals. These are going to be uh, called Dyson uh, Freeman orbitals. So this is pretty much uh, psi star, psi, psi star, and then uh, delta. And after we'll give a more formal description of this, uh, we'll see that this spectral function is uh, pretty much close to, uh, uh, when taken diagonal, to the local density of states. Uh, is the very many body definition of the density of states. Uh, so uh, 
we'll come to this point later, but I think this is important. Uh, we are used to think that we have single particle cartoons uh, of the electronic structure of uh, the systems we study. In this, those cartoons can be made uh, mathematically correct uh, when uh, we take into account the proper definitions. So basically, orbital, single particle orbitals will become uh, Dyson orbitals. Uh, single particle energies will have a proper definition in terms of excitations uh, of the many body uh, states and so on and so forth. But the point is, this can be made uh, mathematically exact in the, in the many body problem. Okay, so somehow this completes uh, the, the picture and uh, uh, from the experimental point of view and the main quantity that ends up in our theory of the photoemission is exactly something that is related to the density of states that indeed is uh, uh, more or less what we expected because we end up with uh, something that resembles a density of states. If you want a density of state that is K resolved, that are the bands, and indeed here we end up with a uh, mathematical quantity that is exactly related to that. So let me just conclude this first part about the theoretical picture of photoemission by uh, taking a statement from uh, this uh, review of modern physics from Damascelli and co-worker that is talking about ARPES uh, and uh, it kind of reverses the, the picture we may have. So it says that ARPES uh, has a large impact on the development of many body theories just because it provides information on the single particle Green's function. So somehow uh, it's, it's an interesting perspective to me since typically we think that we have the Green's function and then that can help uh, understanding uh, photoemission experiments if they say that indeed uh, the advancements on photoemission can actually help understanding what are the features uh, you should get out of a properly defined Green's function. But the main point is that the two are tightly connected. One more comment here uh, that anticipates some of the content of next, next day's lecture is that uh, uh, charge excitations most of the time can be treated uh, with the one particle Green's function. We'll see that neutral excitation instead uh, in order to be properly treated in terms of uh, even qualitative features uh, uh, would require some treatments, namely leading to uh, excitons that are going to be discussed in the, uh, perhaps described within the beta Peter that instead need uh, uh, Green's function that is the two particles Green's function or are tightly related to the two particle Green's function. So that uh, discriminant between charge and neutral excitation is exactly because theoretically those lead to very different uh, uh, methods. Okay, so let's go further into the connection with the Green's function. So let's introduce the Green's function. We have seen this yesterday already. This is the textbook uh, uh, definition. Is the ground state expectation value of a time order product of uh, two field operators, creation and annihilation field. Time ordering means that uh, we have basically two contributions for T1 larger than T2. First, we create uh, a particle in X2 and we annihilate it in X1, vice versa. If uh, T2 is larger than T1, we first annihilate a particle, or if you want to create a hole, evolve it in time, and then take the scalar product uh, or the amplitude uh, at X2. And uh, somehow this describes the, this physical process where we create this electron here, evolve it in time, and then look at the amplitude. So how does this state here project on the state that is at x1, t1, with t1 later than t2, and vice versa for the, um, for the whole. So um, ah, one more comment here is that uh, this construction here may seem uh, a bit uh, odd at first, uh, because why should we have this time ordering? 
uh, that, okay, we kind of understand, but why should we deal with this extra complication while physically we would like just to have direct evolutions in time. That is what we really uh, want to know about. The main point is that mathematically, time ordering uh, is very crucial to uh, use Vick's theorem that was introduced yesterday by Andrea Marini that eventually leads to Feynman diagrams. So the very, very reason uh, by which we need time ordering is exactly to be able to cast the final expressions for the Green's function, the self-energy, in the form of Feynman diagrams. If we were using the other uh, related quantities, like the retarded or the advanced Green's function, uh, that simply wouldn't be, so those are typically thought or, or said to be more physical, like the physical response functions typically are the uh, retarded ones, but uh, do not lead immediately to Feynman diagram. So this just to clarify why this extra complication here. Okay, so uh, that expression for the Green's function is interesting, but is not uh, uh, effective or uh, efficient to use. Uh, there's a very, uh, out of the definition, basically you can immediately cast the Green's function once Fourier transformed, and in fact, uh, while here, we're in the time domain. Here we are in the frequency domain. Uh, the Green's function can be cast just out of the definition in this form here. And this is also very interesting to me because this, if you are familiar with the Green's function, is pretty much the form of a Green's function of a non-interacting system. It's exactly the sum over states, uh, product of the orbitals in X, uh, orbital uh, star in X prime and then a denominator with the single particle eigenvalue. Indeed, this expression is exact. Even in the uh, many body, uh, in a many body formulation, if uh, or if we pay the attention to uh, defining the orbitals and the energies in this way. So energies are actually uh, these uh, differences between n excitations at n minus one or n plus one uh, with the ground state at n. So this is the charge excitation at n minus one electrons, charge excitation at n plus one, and this is what is used for what we call occupied states, for states that are, let's say, uh, with energies below the Fermi level, and this is the definition that we use for empty states. So somehow when we look at a uh, spectrum, we have uh, structures. Structures that are below the Fermi level corresponds to uh, involved many body excitations with n minus one electrons. Structures that are above the Fermi level involve excitations that are with n plus one electrons. By the way, uh, if you want, this may have an experimental counterpart that is, uh, so the quantities that we put together in this density of states spectrum basically uh, are very different uh, qualitatively. So involve excitations n minus one and plus one. So probably it's not by chance that uh, a single experiment like photoemission can access just half of it. So photoemission just uh, access the occupied states uh, inverse photoemission, the empty states. It's true that there are experiments like uh, STS, so scanning tunneling spectroscopy, that is the spectroscopy you do with a STM tip, is local. Uh, you can sweep the bias from negative to positive, so you can actually access both occupied and empty states. So it's not impossible experimentally, but somehow, I mean, this fact here I think reflects in the fact that experimentally, uh, we may not, may not have access to uh, all the quantities together. And uh, so this is for what concerns the energies, and these are the orbitals. The orbitals are just these amplitudes here, ground state, uh, annihilation operator, and then we take uh, the scalar product with excitation state at n minus one, similarly for uh, the uh, empty states. These are called Freeman-Dyson orbitals. Uh, there's, uh, or also Dyson amplitudes. Uh, probably Dyson amplitudes is more popular in the chemistry community. 
can be computed. So there are actual uh, worlds where these are computed. Those are pretty similar to the orbitals we are uh, used to deal with. Uh, though, I mean, they carry the full many body information, now, importantly. So what are then the main differences between this expression here for an interacting system and for a non-interacting system? So already, just from, from here, we can see that these orbitals here are not uh, uh, orthogonal among themselves, among themselves, while they are in a non-interacting picture. So in a non-interacting picture, those are just eigenvectors of a non-interacting single particle Hamiltonian. These are not normalized, second thing, uh, except that uh, the sum over all of them needs to integrate to the density or to the, par to, the, uh, uh, to the occupied ones, to the number of particles. So eventually we end up also with having many more states. This is one of the most important features. So if uh, in a non-interacting system we have, roughly speaking, n electrons and uh, we have n orbitals occupied, pretty much, here, uh, we have many more orbitals, actually infinitely many more. And this is one of the main features of an interacting system. So if you want the spectral weight is not just uh, n Dirac deltas for n electrons, that is what you would get out of Koneshyam DFT or R3 Fock. We have infinitely many peaks, uh, not normalized to one, as if the spectral weight actually would just split in multiple structures. That is the effect uh, of these complicated uh, many body excitations. Actually, the number of excitations that we have in a many body system is much larger. That, that if you want, the, the size of the Hilbert space is much larger than a non interacting counterparts. And uh, we'll see, so this is math, we'll see the physical uh, connection, the physical uh, information we can get out of it. Okay. So, I've said before that what we end up having here in the spectral current, sorry, in the photoemission current is actually the spectral density that has this definition here. And now you can recognize that these guys here are really related to these guys here. Just the basis change, but uh, this is exactly product of those uh, uh, Dyson orbitals there. So. Let's keep going. This is the same uh, definition I've shown uh, you before. How is the spectral function definition? This is defined. This is uh, basically the imaginary part of the Green's function could be defined this way. G minus G dagger, properly taking into account a change of sign due to time ordering. And uh, again, mathematically, this is uh, uh, the object that can be used in a kramers kronig like uh, transform. This is also a spectral representation of the Green's function. If you want, uh, spectral function is the mathematical source of the Green's function, okay, via this uh, uh, kramers kronig If you take this definition here, you plug it here, you end up with this definition here. Okay, uh, so if you want, this is uh, a density matrix, is a uh, frequency resolved or energy resolved or fr uh, density matrix. Okay. And uh, if you take it uh, local, so not X, X prime, but just uh, X, you obtain this that should look very familiar. This is the typical definition we use for uh, density of states, uh, very basic. We see probably these uh, very early classes in quantum mechanics. Uh, this is the proper uh, many body definition of the density of states. Okay, so uh, this is a definition. Uh, how can we compute uh, uh, this quantity. So I'll uh, assume you are familiar with this equation here. That is the Dyson equation for the Green's function. So somehow if 
you want to compute your Green's function, you can start from the knowledge of uh, G0, that is, uh, non, in this case, is the non-interacting uh, Green's function where we have simply dropped the interaction. But here, in principle, we could use any uh, reference Green's function, paying attention then to uh, get rid of uh, the extra potential we we use here. But so this is just a side comment. But this is an exact equation for the Green's function that can be computed if we know the self-energy. This would be the third uh, part of my talk. So just bear this in mind for the moment. Formal solution to this equation is basically uh, operatorially this uh, inversion here. And uh, if we keep in mind the Lehman representation for the Green's function, we can arrive ex at an expression like this. Uh, so first uh, comment, this is true only for systems that have discrete states. So this is usually called the quasi-particle equation, but this is true only when we have discrete states. I'll come back to this point later that is uh, mathematically subtle. But for these discrete states we can. And the main point is that what is the equation obeyed by the uh, Dyson orbitals, well, it's pretty much a Schrodinger equation, except that uh, basically the self-energy is here and plays the role of a potential, but uh, the self-energy is frequency dependent and uh, basically each orbital feels a different uh, potential. So feels the self-energy at a different potential that is exactly its own eigenvalue. So somehow if you want this is also a, a non-linear problem and so on. These are real because of discrete states, but this is, uh, in a sense, uh, the um, paradigmatic of the extra complexity you have uh, to deal uh, when uh, dealing with quasi-particles uh, or Dyson orbitals, that is that uh, you have an orbital dependent potential there, and that is at variance with the uh, mean field cases. Uh, also, if you want, this is the origin of the fact that these orbitals here are not orthogonal. If you think about, uh, uh, basically, each S Dyson orbital obeys a different uh, Schrodinger equation. So they are not uh, the eigen different eigenvectors of the same Hermitian operator. For discrete state, the self-energy is Hermitian. Again, not granted in general for uh, when you have a continuum of states. But uh, each of them have a different, uh, belong to a different uh, operator, so they are not orthogonal. Okay, so this was so far the uh, Lehman representation. We'll see now another different representation that can undergo the name of quasi particle, can be named as quasi-particle representation. We just start again from the formal solution of the Dyson equation. Basically, out of here, uh, we can just look this problem as an inversion problem with a parameter, omega. So a parameterized uh, inversion that we can cast uh, in the form of a parameterized diagonalization problem. Okay, so omega here is a parameter. In this case, the self-energy is no longer Hermitian in general. So we need basically to, when we have a non-Hermitian diagonalization, we end up with left and right eigenvectors. Eigenvalues left, right are the same, but may be complex. Uh, everything is labeled with omega, and if we take this inversion here out of this diagonalization, this eigen problem here, we end up with this expression. That looks similar to the previous one, if you recall this. But it's not the same. And uh, the reason are first, uh, here we have uh, left and right eigenvectors that are not uh, one the complex conjugate of the other. This is more complex and actually involve, uh, if you want, the overlap matrix to the minus one in passing from one to the other. This is standard uh, linear algebra. We have this omega dependence parametric. and. Uh, also, the omega dependence is here in the, um, 
in the denominator. While here we had uh, real numbers uh, and uh, uh, complex conjugate of the orbitals. So, in principle, uh, relevant poles of this expression can be obtained just taking this denominator to zero. And uh, so, if you let, let me try to be a, a bit clearer here. This is an exact expression. How, so now we are trying to look at the features of these expressions, uh, and as a main feature, we would like to locate the poles of this object here. Uh, the point is that being this uh, a non hermitian problem, this can be complex, uh, and uh, so the fixed point of this uh, denominator equal to zero, that is where the poles are, can be in the complex plane. So this expression here, basically, locally, can be described uh, as uh, a sum over uh, discrete poles that are far from the real axis. Okay, while, if we look at the Lehman, if you recall, this number here is a uh, differences of total energies. So there's no way that is complex. This number here, whatsoever many body uh, complicated system we have at hand, are real all the time. Total energy differences. Okay, here is uh, uh, the two representations are exact. It is the way uh, how to reconcile them. So this is the picture, if you want the density of states, spectral function integrated, uh, that we have out of the Lehman representation. As we said, a lot of states, uh, okay, a uh, feature of the many body problem, not normalized to one, a second feature of the many body problem. And these states kind of envelop and form structures. And these structures can locally also be described by, instead of multiple poles close to the real axis, as uh, uh, discrete poles far from the real axis. Okay? So if you want, uh, these are two analytical continuation to the imaginary axis of the same object. And uh, if we are dealing with discrete states, the two actually uh, collapse one onto the other. That is why we can have a quasi-particle equation with the self-energy. So every single time we have a, a representation of the Green's function that involves the self-energy, that typically is related to this quasi-particle representation. Uh, if instead we <coughs> just have the Dyson orbitals, that is related to this uh, Lehman representation. The two basically are connected for discrete states. So somehow if we are not in, uh, when, we, when do we have discrete states? When we are not in the thermodynamic limit. So here, uh, that is also interesting mathematically, the thermodynamic limit makes a mess, uh, as very often happens. Uh, that is basically these discrete states get into a continuum, create a, a branch cut, uh, and then our Green's function becomes a, a polydromic function. That is why, uh, basically, we can have two different analytic continuations. Otherwise, the analytic continuation should be unique. Here we have two different ones, uh, and the reason is that we have at least two branches of the Green's function. So the math gets pretty much subtle and complicated. If you really want to dig into this, uh, there's Benam Farid that has been is a probably former Cambridge professor, is, uh, has uh, written a lot of uh, math paper on the math here. Uh, if you want to dig into the complexity of the math here, just have a look at this uh, works here. Okay, uh, now, Let's go back a bit to physics. So we have seen that, uh, in principle, if we have a self-energy, we can compute uh, the uh, Green's function. Let's have a look at how it looks in an interacting system. So this is the spectral function of a non-interacting system, just so one peak, sharp, Dirac delta-like. Then we put a self-energy, and here we can simplify the exercise, uh, assuming that the self-energy is diagonal on the basis of uh, states that diagonalize also the Hamiltonian. So this becomes a scalar problem. We can have a Taylor expansion around this point here, epsilon i, so the non-interacting given value, that is this point here, 
plus the real part of the self energy. We do the Taylor expansion and uh, we end up with this form here of the Green's function. So this is first a uh, pole that has a main structure at located at E capital EI, so the pole is shifted. Then we end up with a finite uh, um, broadening of the pole. So here is infinitely sharp. Here we have a finite broadening, and this is really related to the imaginary part of the self energy. This is important. Okay, so the imaginary part of the self energy has a role, has a meaning, that is the broadening of the spectral features we get uh, into uh, the calculation. And then we have something that is also interesting uh, and uh, natively many body, a renormalization factor. So the, this is not one, this renormalization factor deals with the derivative of the self energy with respect to the frequency. So it's related to the uh, frequency dependency of the self energy. And so this basically says that the main quasi-particle peaks does not integrate to one, but integrate to 0 0.7. Where is the extra 0 0.3 weight? Basically goes somewhere else, typically into a satellite structure here. Okay, so take a message here, sharp features in the non-interacting case, broadened, shifted and broadened feature in the interacting case with also some spectral weight due to the uh, renormalization factor. Okay, here is the nice cartoon again, probably from the Damascelli uh, paper. So this is uh, K resolved, so ARP is from a non-interacting system. So K resolved density of states, this is how it looks like uh, in an interacting system. So we have sharp peaks close to the Fermi level, then the farther we get from the Fermi level, the broader the peaks get, uh, the, uh, the more damped, and when we reduce the spectral weight, we also need to compensate, so we have extra structures that are the satellites. Good. All of these uh, are intrinsic features uh, that can get already out of the spectral function or the spectral density, <laughs> and are due to the dynamical, so frequency dependence, and non-hermitian nature of the self energy. So this extra complexity that we have in the self energy is actually what mathematically gives uh, the physical content of the many body uh, complexity. Okay, the GW self energy. So the, this point we have understood that Green's function are interesting, that they actually carry a lot of physical information that can be used to interpret experiments, but we don't actually know how to compute them in practice. And here is the last part of this talk, that is how do we get uh, a self energy that we can use to compute our Green's function. And um, uh, a very popular approach to this uh, uh, comes from Eddings equation. So Eddings in 1965 introduced this equation, basically had this uh, perturbation here and then uh, used a, a linear response approach with respect to this uh, uh, perturbation. What I think Andrea yesterday called the Swinger uh, approach, it leads to this set of equations, five equations, uh, self-consistently. So a set of five closed equations, okay. One is the Green's fun the, the Dyson equation that we already know for connecting G to sigma. There is also a very similar equation connecting W to P that is the irreducible polarizability. And then we have an expression for the self energy that involves G, W, and gamma. That is the uh, vertex. The vertex is this object here that is uh, pretty much related to the linear response uh, in, uh, of the Green's function itself. So <coughs> this I think that uh, G gamma G is the um, linear response of uh, uh, G itself. And this is probably the G minus one in the V. So it's the linear response of G minus one. So this is really linear response. If you're familiar with 
time dependent DFT is DFXC. But here the kernel is way more complicated. The kernel is the self energy. And indeed, we have the derivative of the self energy with respect to G. So this is the linear response input into the um, vertex. And this enters, uh, of course, uh, in the linear response uh, cast into the form of polarizability. These are closed, very difficult to uh, solve and connected in this form here, the so-called Eddings pentagon. Uh, mathematical note, uh, all these Dyson equations uh, can be cast in the form of uh, geometric series. This form here that you can resum and you, if, if you sum the series is exactly end up uh, with the formal solution of these equations. Uh, importantly, I tried a couple of times to do this and this works pretty well if uh, your uh, VP is close. So the fact that this series converge just within a radius of convergence of one is true. And uh, uh, so somehow you can use this if your VP is small. Otherwise, instead, the actual Dyson equations do not suffer of, of this problem here. So the, the step in going from this contracted expression to this basically involves extra assumptions that lead you to uh, convergence issues. Just to say, so Eddings equation can be cast in the form of Feynman diagrams, and I think that these equations being this complicated here, diagrams are very useful just to describe and to look at the topology of the equation. So which Green's function vertex is connected to which other uh, uh, bear or um, uh, screened interaction and, uh, and so on. Now, out of these equations, basically, we can uh, immediately devise an approximation that is called GW if we drop this extra term here. So basically, these equations, there's a, an internal hierarchy, need to be broken somewhere if we want to start guessing some uh, uh, approximations. So if we drop this and we approximate the vertex just as one point, Okay, that corresponds to a uh, simple linear response uh, for the uh, Green's function, as if the sigma were not depending on G. Okay, uh, basically we have then uh, Dirac deltas here, Dirac deltas here, and this gives us immediately the polarizability written as GG, that is the uh, probably cast in a, in a different form, but it's exactly the polarizability you would get out of a non-interacting system, was Green's function is G, okay? And the self-energy becomes G times W. Let's, this is, uh, Andrea yesterday introduced the GW approximation in a heuristic way, looking at the physics, uh, the physics of the screening you get uh, there. This is a mathematical uh, way we can look at it. Here in terms of diagrams uh, is uh, the way it looks like, G times W. And if we take into account the geometric series uh, for W, we have G times V, then G, V, V, and a single bubble that is a polarizability, two bubbles, three bubbles, uh, summed up to infinity. Uh, this is so-called RPA screening, okay? Uh, so, some messages. Uh, GW, we've seen, we have dropped part of the Eddings equation that uh, accounts for dropping diagrams, uh, and there are a number of diagrams that are clearly not there, and the first one that comes to mind is already the second order, and this is the second order exchange diagram. This is not there, and yesterday we were talking about uh, self-interaction, this is uh, the main responsible for uh, GW uh, not being exact uh, in one electron cases because this diagram is not there and uh, it doesn't uh, correct for the contribution out of this diagram here. So basically we have self-screening in GW. Second thing is uh, in this language of Green's function and Coulomb interaction, we can write the artery foc as GV and the diagram would be this. So GW is just uh, something that is 
similar to artery fog, but takes into account screening, not just static screening, dynamical screening. Uh, the two have to come uh, uh, together in a sense. So if you want, is uh, just one step, uh, pretty complicated one. So it's a, in GW there's much more complication, but uh, somehow is uh, next step to uh, the artery fog. Still in terms of resemblances, um, GW, we saw this expansion here up to infinite order. So this is all resummed. Uh, we can see some similarities with the second born approximation uh, that in terms of an energy is related to, so second born is a self energy, but can be derived from uh, the MP2 uh, total energy of uh, quantum chemistry. Okay, without self consistence, then there are some uh, fine details here, but uh, if we take this MP2 total energy, and the second born self energy, we see that the first, uh, so this is the exchange diagram, second order direct diagram is there. And then in MP2, we just match the second order with each, uh, its uh, exchange counterpart. So this is particle symmetry. So this is exact in one electron cases. Instead, GW keeps going with the infinite terms in the polarizability, so it's not exact. GW, at the, on the other side, has uh, a very um, much better polarizability. So for systems that are very polarizable, GW is ways better than uh, MP2. So somehow MP2 actually is used for small molecules in chemistry. And uh, yes. yeah. <laughs> um, so GW works uh, by, <laughs> so it's, it's not uh, a secret. It works very well, I'll, uh, but as we said, Issues, uh, self-interaction is there. I've listed here a number of uh, uh, issues. Uh, there are a number of uh, recent papers, even more recent than these, about how to in better include vertex corrections. So vertex corrections has been a, a mantra in the, so at least since I, I'm uh, looking at the GW literature, every now and then there is a uh, suggestion for vertex corrections. This is pretty much still an open field. Uh, so satellites in GW, we've seen that satellites are uh, uh, genuine features of uh, uh, interacting systems. Actually, uh, they are pretty bad in plain GW. So if we do G0, W0 without any self-consistency, they tend to be at wrong energies. Uh, if we take some, some self-consistency in there, basically the satellites are damped and you get this vanilla satellite that is spread all over the frequency. So they're really damped. Here the figure is difficult to read, but you can really see that if you put self-consistency in, satellites are gone. Uh, here there's uh, Tommaso Chiarotti's poster that has some more results on the homogeneous electron gas in this case. Uh, similar results were also uh, recently obtained by Crescent, I think this is Diamond, and you see in the self, uh, fully self-consistent GW that is solid line. Basically, the dash satellite is just gone. And uh, this is another very interesting uh, work on satellites by the group of Lucia Reining that uh, uh, just compare uh, with recent photoemission measurements on silicon in this case. Uh, and uh, this red here would be the G position of the GW satellites uh, that clearly you see doesn't match the uh, photoemission position. You have to include extra terms to GW and they do it uh, by doing GW plus cumulant. I think that uh, nowadays that is a pretty common uh, beyond GW approximation. This was 2011, has been used since uh, these days, it's very popular and when you add cumulant on top of GW, you actually get decent positions of the satellites. Then in order to better compare with the photoemission amplitudes, you need to take properly into account the three-step model. So not just the first step that is this spectral function, but also uh, secondary losses, uh, extrinsic uh, losses, and so on, that can be modeled easily. And you get some very decent uh, comparison. Also here, just, uh, I mean, other recent work. Thanks.
Thank you, Andrea.